Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine Santoro, Director of Programming at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. And on behalf of NICM, welcome to our webinar today. Physicians estimate that more than 20% of care is unnecessary. Unnecessary care has medical and financial costs. Excessive testing and treatment generate mistakes and injuries believed to cause 30,000 deaths each year. Inappropriate care comes at a considerable financial cost, a staggering $265 billion. Initiatives like Choosing Wisely and Practicing Wisely have started a national conversation about inappropriate care, and we're pleased to have a prestigious panel of experts with us today to continue a conversation on strategies to curb unnecessary treatment and spending. Before we hear from them, I'd like to thank Nickham's president and CEO, Nancy Chalkley, and the Nickham team who helped to convene this event today, including Kate Ellis, Caitlin Smith, Kirsten Wade, and Alexis Wing. I'd also like to thank Jim Fields and Lucy Liu and their Oliver Wyman team for their help as well. You can find biographical information for all of our speakers along with today's agenda and copies of the slides on our website. We also invite you to live tweet during the webinar today using the hashtag Too Much Care. I am now pleased to introduce our panel of speakers. Today we're joined by Dr. Marty Macri, a leading expert and researcher on the causes of preventable harm and waste in healthcare, including overtreatment and overprescribing. He's also a renowned surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Michael Drescher, Director of Value-Based Contracting at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. More than 70% of primary care providers in Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee networks participate in at least one pay-for-value program. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee is also committed to empowering physicians with tools to provide well-coordinated care that is cost-effective and evidence-based. Dr. Ty Gluckman, Medical Director of the Center for Cardiovascular Analytics, Research, and Data Science at the Providence St. Joseph Heart Institute in Portland, Oregon, and he's a leader in care improvement strategies. And Lucy Liu, a principal in Oliver Wyman's Health and Life Sciences practice, where she has advised organizations on the shift to value-based care and worked with providers and health plans to implement appropriate use measures. I'll now turn the floor over to Lucy. Thanks, Catherine, for, um, for the great introduction and convening us all today for such an important and timely topic. Um, so just by way of introduction, I'm Lucy Liu. Um, I'm a principal with Oliver Wyman Health and Life Sciences Practice. Um, as Catherine said, I've worked with a lot of the largest health systems and payers in the country on strategies around value-based care. Um, so often from either the payer side or from the side of the, the provider, whether that's a large physician group or a big health um, or hospital system, helping organizations um, develop more value-based products, payer provider, joint ventures, partnerships, um, partnered health plan products. So um, I'm very excited here to, to talk about how, again, payers and providers can continue to work together toward improving value-based care by tackling appropriateness. Um, and at Oliver Wyman, I also lead customer success for Practicing Wisely, which is a business that's um, being incubated by Oliver Wyman and Dr. Marty McCary. We are focused on developing a measuring stick for appropriateness in medicine. Um, Michael and Ty, uh, would you mind doing some quick intros just so the group on the phone can kind of hear your voice a little bit early on, and then we can turn it over to Marty. Sure. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Michael Drescher. Uh, I'm the Director of Value-Based Contracting here at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Been with the health plan for about seven years, um, and I am housed in uh, our organization within our provider network management area. Um, I'm on the network innovation team where we look at different models and different approaches to, uh, to moving to value-based arrangements. We really focus that on uh, primary care space, uh, specialists in the facility side, uh, and responsible for trying to work with our clinical and contracting teams to come up with uh, creative new approaches for um, moving farther into the value-based world. 
Thanks, Michael. Uh, this is Ty, Ty Gluckman. I am a practicing cardiologist out in Portland, Oregon, and serve as medical director for the Center for Cardiovascular Analytics Research and Data Science, or CARDS. Uh, that is a center that's dedicated towards using real-world data to stimulate investigator-initiated research to close gaps in care and improve care delivery. Uh, I've had a particular interest nationally in uh, highlighting appropriateness of care, and it's a real pleasure a little bit later on to share some thoughts about how in a lot of different spaces, and my focus in particular in cardiovascular medicine, the opportunities are bound to be able to move uh, in this direction of helping people focus in on and drive towards more appropriate care. Great. Thanks, Michael and Ty. All right, Marty, turning it over to you to kick us off. Well, thank you, Lucy. Um, and uh, I want to thank both Nickham and Oliver Wyman for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, this is really exciting. This is, I think, the future of healthcare here. So thank you, everybody, for being a part of this conversation. Um, I'd like to start with really the genesis of the concept of can we do a better job of measuring quality? If you think about the general delivery of healthcare in any setting in the world, a patient will enter the system. That is, a person will come to us um, seeking care for a particular ailment or a question. The next step is we physicians do something. We order a diagnostic test. We send off some labs. Or in my own practice, we decide to perform surgery. And then the third step is the recovery. That is, the patient has a course of recovery that is either marked by the event of a complication or by the lack of an event or by the lack of any measurement. We've been entirely focused on measuring the second arrow in healthcare, but we've forgotten about the first arrow in the measurement science. That is, <clears throat> when we talk about measuring outcomes, what we're really talking about is measuring complication rates once we've done something. And the vast majority of traditional quality measures have really been triggered by us clinicians doing something. The bigger question right now is the first arrow, did that patient need the diagnostic test? Did they need the medication? Did they need the operation? So, uh, quality science has been focused on this second half of this uh, illustration, and we set out to ask the question, how can we capture appropriateness of care? And the reason we were interested in the subject of appropriateness is report after report have, has come out suggesting things are getting pretty bad. In some areas of medicine, overtreatment is sometimes endemic. There were multiple reports that have raised um, an alarm uh, from the article Overkill um, a piece on unnecessary care in NPR. Um, there have been stories after stories of different indications for procedures where the indications have become more narrow once the procedure has been studied in more detail. If there's one theme in the medical literature over the last five years, it's that our indications for doing things, generally speaking, as an overall trend, are getting more and more narrow. That is, we're looking back and realizing we may have treated too many patients and the true indications are more narrow. The second study you see here listed in this is a study published in PLOS titled Overtreatment in the United States. I'll just comment on this for a second because this was performed by my research team at Johns Hopkins. Rather than try to estimate the amount of inappropriate care using clinical records, and we know claims is not a great data source for, appropriate, for studying appropriateness. We instead simply asked doctors around the country, 2,100 physicians from around the United States, in your opinion, what percent of medical care do you believe is delivered inappropriately? Their answer was 21%. If we're delivering 21% of care uh, inappropriately, as these doctors responded to in the survey, 
we've got a crisis of appropriateness right now in healthcare. So as we talk about quality science and as we talk about the cost crisis in healthcare, I think that's one big theme many of us are interested in. The uh, subject of how to measure appropriateness led us to the concept of can we get experts together who practice in a particular specialty and ask them on an annual basis, is there a pattern of doing something or not doing something that would represent overtreatment in your opinion? So we've asked physicians to define for us what is a metric, but not a traditional quality metric looking at care at the individual patient level, instead a frequency metric, if you will, a practice pattern. So looking at, say, for example, in this graph, a distribution of surgeons in the United States by their proportion of lumpectomy patients that they operate, operate on, that they bring back for a re-excision or a second operation to remove more breast tissue. That rate should be zero to 15%. Actually, it shouldn't be zero, it should be at least one because some patients need a re-excision and it doesn't matter how good you are. If you're the best in the world, you should be bringing some small percentage of patients back for a re-excision after lumpectomy. But then there's a group of physicians that are doing it 30, 40, even more percent of the time. If you looked at individual physicians, there are individuals with re-excision rates over 50%. That is, these doctors in the United States are bringing their patients back for a re-excision after a lumpectomy more than half the time. This shows how practice patterns are one way of measuring appropriateness and how we can use data um, specific to individual physicians so that the data is highly actionable. And the idea is not to round up outlier physicians and put them in jail. The idea is to simply help them. In another area, we asked doctors in GI about an area of waste or inappropriate care that could be measured. And they told us that one practice pattern that is commonly abused and is highly measurable is the rate by which a GI doctor does an upper and lower endoscopy on different days when those procedures are indicated within a 30-day period. And so most doctors have a different day rate of 1% to 10%, and that's expected. There are times you simply can't do both upper and lower endoscopy on the same day. You may want to do an upper endoscopy to look for the source of a GI bleeding, and if that's negative, then schedule the lower endoscopy. There are many good clinical reasons to do it on different days. But collectively, that would be less than 10% of all non-emergent elective endoscopy pairs in one's practice. But the data show, as the doctors suggested, that there's a group of physicians that do it routinely on two separate days. The research with the citation listed there indicates that when the physician owns the surgery center, it's a much more common trend. These are highly measurable practice patterns at the individual level that allow us to help these outliers and at minimum, let them know that the rest of the physicians who see patients in a like clinical scenario uh, have a much lower rate. Another metric is um, skin cancer surgery. And this is, these are a few of the uh, hundreds of measures that have since been developed and um, can be used to measure appropriateness. But I'm gonna explain this one because this is a good example of a metric that has been used um, to, for improvement with results. And it's the Mohs surgeons, that is skin cancer surgeons that use the Mohs surgery technique to remove a skin cancer in stages. Now, a skin cancer, the same cancer can be removed with sometimes few or multiple different stages or blocks. Now, surgeons get paid per block. So you can imagine that a small fraction of surgeons are responding to a perverse financial incentive or may just be using poor surgical technique 
or maybe unknowingly uh, outliers in the number of blocks that they removed, but that this is something, again, highly measurable. This report showing most surgeons, on average, how many blocks do they use to remove a, a skin cancer um, in the national data, uh, where they stand relative to their peers. This is, again, a distribution of all most surgeons in the United States, about 2,000 of them. This actual report went out to 1,000, or about half of the most surgeons in the United States, simply showing them this is where you are, this is the rest of the country. The dotted line indicated sort of the threshold based on clinical wisdom, the experts said, would be a reasonable threshold of what's considered excessive. Well, the data came back, and of those who those outliers who received a report, the notified group immediately reduced the number of stages per case. Overall, 83% of outliers reduced the number of stages per case, and that reduction was sustained over the course of a year. Uh, this data is forthcoming and is being published by John Albertini. The project cost about $150,000 to talk to the experts, develop the metric in a way that's very clinically wise, and to actually do the mail it, uh, mailing and postage. But although the project cost $150,000, the savings to CMS was about $22 million. So this project demonstrates how practice pattern measure is both feasible can be well received when it uses physician input and um, very effective in reducing inappropriate care. We also invited those who received a letter to give feedback on the project. How did you feel about seeing the data on where you stand relative to your peers? Here's a sample of some of the responses that we got. Thank you for the report. I love showing this to my patients. Um, Thanks for sharing the data. I'll work on my technique. I'd like to learn more about the retraining offered by the American College of Mohs Surgeons. While we braced for people to be angry that um, they've received a performance report, instead they thanked us for being able to see the data. And I think they also appreciated being able to see it in a confidential peer-to-peer -peer fashion. As we were working on this problem, we also thought about medications. If there's one story that captures that first graph the best, that is, if there's one problem in American healthcare that captures how bad the problem of inappropriate care has uh, become, it's the story of medications. In 2007, we physicians in the United States prescribed 2.4 billion prescriptions, but last year it hit almost 4.6 billion. Did disease double in the last 10 years? No, many people say we have a crisis of appropriateness in prescribing. This may be fueled in part by patients coming in with a very consumerist attitude. I've had patients come in demanding a certain medications. Pediatricians have described parents demanding an antibiotic or primary care physicians telling me, quite frankly, Marty, I'm burnt out. I mean, office-based fee-for-service care is like a treadmill, and when people come in demanding medications, I just don't have the time to spend with the patients to get to the root causes. This crisis of appropriateness in healthcare blindsided us with the opioid epidemic, and this one study in particular really uh, hit home for me because I was part of the problem. I had overprescribed opioids for most of my career with good intentions and a lot of bad science. It took a major wake-up call, but this paper, even after the general awareness in our field, really, really sort of um, struck me hard. And that was a study showing that 45.6% of patients who did not take opioids while they were recovering from surgery in the hospital were still given an opioid prescription at the time of discharge. Now, for us to be prescribing opioid, opioids to patients who weren't even taking them the 24 hours before discharge just shows how bad the appropriateness problem has gotten.
Plus, we have, I've talked to colleagues and asked before this study came out, what should we be prescribing for patients after a standard C-section or laparoscopic cholecystectomy procedure? Can we agree on a best practice? Well, of course, you can imagine everybody had different reasons and factors that needed to be considered. But the residents who write most of the prescriptions at our institution said, look, we really need a quick reference guide and we need some sort of guidance. So we decided in a narcotic naive patient that has a particular procedure, we can agree on a general range of best practices. We developed consensus guidelines using a group of expert surgeons, nurses, pharmacists, residents, and patients, importantly. I can tell you in this panel using the Delphi method, the patients always voted for less opioid uh, pills than the surgeons who did the operations. We decided to put these uh, best practice guidelines on the web for anybody. Uh, it's available at solvethecrisis.org, and these guidelines have been since published by the American College of Surgeons in their journal. Uh, it, should it shouldn't be the Wild West whether or not um, patients should be prescribed 10 oxycodone, 30 or 40 after a lumpectomy. We should have a general best practices. And in fact, these guidelines represent one local best practice example. But the national data using the practice pattern approach shows that if you graft all surgeons in the United States who perform a lumpectomy, that is a breast lumpectomy, uh, by the average number of oxycodone five milligram equivalents that they prescribe, most surgeons are still giving over 20 oxycodone after this procedure, which the expert panel decided should received, uh, receive either ibuprofen with acetaminophen in combination with multimodality therapy or a maximum of 10, depending on the patient oxycodone tablets, assuming an average adult narcotic naive patient. Those patients in the national data show that it's still the Wild West. Patients are still getting sometimes over 40. And making the data actionable by presenting it by individual physician, you can see that certain individual physicians here, uh, blacked out here with a bar, are prescribing on average, as a practice average, over 40 oxycodone 5 milligram equivalent opioid pills in patients after this standardized procedure. So this data is highly actionable. It's data that can be used. Um, this work has been funded in part by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation here. It's expanded and the model seems to be very well liked by physicians. That is a physician approach using peer-to-peer -peer benchmarked confidential data sharing. To finally get at this issue of how do we measure appropriateness in healthcare so this uh, is also grown to a partnership where uh, Practicing Wisely is offering this uh, to entities that are interested in learning more about it. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the team and thank you for your time. Thanks, Marty. Um, always, it's always energizing to hear about the research that started all of this. Um, you know, could you, I think it's, it's really inspiring to see the, how, how much farther the research has gone, you know, into how many different specialty areas, um, you know, led by, led by your team at Hopkins as well as our team at Practicing Wisely. Um, could you speak a little bit to how the physician community has overall adopted this concept of appropriateness, you know, how they've responded to your research and, and other appropriateness-related initiatives? Sure, I think initially the thought was, and the intention, intention of the original grant was, to notify extreme outliers, that is those greater than two standard deviations above the mean, know that their frequency of doing something around a very smart clinical metric was, was far out there. But impressively, the American College of Most Surgeons and some of the other societies said, hey, we don't want to just notify outliers. We want to let everybody know where they stand. And it's, if you, if you will, it's not a number grade. That is, there may not be a difference between having a breast re-excision rate of 11 versus 10% in terms of quality. Those differences are negligible at this level of claims analysis. 
but it's good for people to see where they stand and whether or not they're extreme outliers. So I've been very impressed at the receptivity uh, that we've seen out there. We just completed a mailing of about 11,000 letters uh, with the Society of General Internal Medicine to primary care physicians whose patients are on more than uh, who are on more than 15 medications on average, or a cutoff point of greater than two standard deviations of the number of medications of an average senior in a primary care physician's practice. So um, there's a good example of an association that said, let's do something about this. Wow. Yeah, that's great. And Ty, I wanted to turn it over to you for a second. Um, you know, practicing in both the academic setting as well as the community setting, what what kinds of things have you seen in your experience? Um, what kinds of efforts are providers or payers making around appropriateness, whether that's, you know, through practicing wisely or choosing wisely or other initiatives? Yeah, so it's a great question, and I, I always get uh, reinvigorated every time I hear Marty speak. Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing whether you're in academics or you're in the community practice. Everybody gets up each morning who's a clinician, whether they're a physician or otherwise, hoping that and I think thinking that they're doing best by their patients every day. Uh, and I think one of the challenges that exists is you often have a practice pattern that's shaped by inertia. Um, I love Marty's quote uh, that it's by good intent but bad science, and we can all go to places where there are people who certainly abuse the system, but the vast majority of individuals are coming in with the intent of doing good things, and it either may be bad science or haven't kept up with the times, and there is new science that would inform them that their practice is not consistent with what we would consider um, uh, ideal. And so the other thing that's a common theme about this is you know, many of us as clinicians, whether we sit in a cubicle at our own office, we practice largely in silos. Now, we may be employed by a hospital health system, an independent practice, but many of us don't know what our colleagues are doing literally in the next office over. And so I think the availability to have transparent, non-punitive data can help people understand where they sit in a benchmark perspective that doesn't cast a question outrightly on whether you're practicing correctly or not, but allows you to see where you sit in the whole spectrum of providers out there. And so in both the academic world and in the community-based world, I've seen relatively little of this work done about what Marty had spoken about in, with regard to understanding your prescribing habits when it relates to drugs, uh, your ordering practice when it relates to imaging studies, your procedural rate when it comes to certain procedures you're doing. Uh, and it's partly because these hospitals or health systems, albeit perhaps improved upon in the future with EMRs, um, haven't had the ability to aggregate that data in an effective way. So where we've seen more, again, in both interfacing in the academic world and the community world is we've seen, at least in my local current community, I'm part of a health system that happens to have a health plan, and increasingly there, as part of paper performance, non-punitive data sharing, sharing data back with clinicians to say, listen, here's the full spectrum of ordering of this type of test by colleagues who have the same type of specialty. This is where you sit. These are de-identified individuals. And, and that type of information is, A, new. We've never seen it before. And, B, I think quite empowering because a lot of us like to think we're doing right by our patients. And that kind of information, especially when shared in a non-punitive way, can drive people to say, huh, maybe in fact I'm not doing as well as I otherwise could. So I think that there are a lot of levers that can be pulled to effectively share data to allow people to understand um, and doesn't cause people necessarily to retreat to their corner, which is a natural reflex, but to say, w where can I actually make improvements? Yeah, yeah, that's, well, it's great to hear about some of those you know, newer emerging, um, almost sounds like homegrown efforts to provide that kind of data and transparency to physicians. Um, so on, on an episode that's coming up of the Oliver Wyman Health Podcast, um, Marcus Osborne, he's Walmart's v Vice President of Health Transformation, um, he recently spoke to us about the kind of egregious degree of inappropriate care that they found when they were going through 
the data of their, you know, million and a half Walmart employees in the U.S., um, and, you know, by their estimate, something like a third of the care that their employees receive is unnecessary and either ineffective or, you know, at best or potentially harmful. Um, and it, it really, I think, speaks to your point that, you know, when these efforts exist, they're through smaller research efforts, ingrown, um, you know, provider-developed um, research efforts to show that transparency, there aren't universally available measuring sticks to look at practice patterns of appropriateness. Um, and, you know, through the Walmart program, they found that, you know, they developed these centers of excellence where they realized that by sending patients to very high quality institutions like Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic, um, these staggering statistics that, you know, 30 to 50 percent of the patients who thought they needed spine surgery didn't, 90 percent of C-sections and inductions were unnecessary, more than 80 percent of patients who were sent for a stent didn't need it, 10 percent of their associates were falsely diagnosed with cancer, and 30 percent of them, 30 percent of the people who thought they had cancer had the correct diagnosis but the wrong treatment. Um, so, and, you know, it's, it's hard to see those statistics and not get worked up over it, but then, you know, you realize that there are just aren't broadly available measuring sticks that help us understand, um, you know, what those practice patterns really are that help providers understand how they're practicing compared to their peers, whether they're peers down the hall or peers across the country. Um, and that, that lack of, of transparency, the lack of a measuring stick that's available was the problem that, you know, really motivated Marty and motivated Practicing Wisely to, to start to develop those measuring sticks um, and to help physicians understand what they previously had no visibility into. Um, so with that, I wanted to turn it over a little bit to, to you again, Ty, to talk about, you know, as the, as the chair of our Cardiology Advisory Council, um, it'd be great if you could tell us a little bit about what the Practicing Wisely approach is to measure development and the impact that you have seen this have on practicing physicians that we've rolled this out with. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, and it's a real honor to be able to chat with all of you today. I'm also honored to be able to work with some extremely talented cardiology clinicians as part of our advisory council who, uh, so to speak, have drank the Kool-Aid and really believe, much like uh, all of us speaking to you today, that this is a, a, not only an appropriate, no pun intended, or purposeful pun, uh, that is the appropriate way that we need to move, um, but it's an integral part of good stewardship of healthcare resources, and in fact, the intersection of quality and cost that may come up in the Q&A, talking about that as well. So this slide is really meant to call out the fact that when we assess clinician-physician performance, probably most well-known to many of you is, is uh, how is that person's outcomes? So take, for an example, an interventional cardiologist. We know that for people that come in and get a coronary angioplasty or a stent, we want those people to have low rates of complications and a low risk of mortality, death with a procedure. And we'd all agree that's listening today in the audience, that's a key important thing. And in fact, that's what hospitals have historically done, and it's measuring that quality piece of the puzzle. Increasingly, we're recognizing that there's variability in how different providers uh, use resources or spend money in the process of delivering their care. And we're beginning to see more and more attention drawn into the cost piece, and quality divided by cost is often given as a value equation uh, that assesses uh, essentially the delivery of care. But what's missing from that is the appropriateness piece, and it's not something other than for those of us on the phone in a smaller group nationwide who have focused on is should we even be doing the procedure to begin with? And so in the same example that I gave you of the interventional cardiologist, you could have someone who has phenomenal quality. They have low risks of morbidity and mortality with that procedure. They do it at a low cost of care, but we don't ask the question necessarily as often as we should is, should that interventional cardiologist have been doing the procedure to begin with? In the same, very same vein, you could take a spine surgeon who may have low readmission rates, 
quality. A appropriate or, excuse me, a lower length of stay as an assessment of cost or lower spend for delivering high quality care. But should that spine surgery, borrowing from Lucy, your example earlier, have even been done to begin with? So a good part of the measure development that, we're gonna, that I'm gonna talk about just for a few minutes is trying to identify case examples where there is an opportunity to call out appropriateness based upon evidence that's in the literature and share that information more broadly with clinicians in a non-punitive way to hopefully shift people towards more appropriate care. To that end, there is a formal process that we go through when developing these measures, and it starts with an ideation. I'm in the cardiology arena, and the concept of appropriate use criteria is very well established and has been now for 15 years, where we actually have ratings panels in multiple different areas from imaging procedures to interventional or invasive procedures, um, and even whether or not certain types of tests should be done to begin with. However, I will call out the fact that in many other areas or disciplines, they may not as be robustly developed thus far to date. So we come up with some ideas shaped by what's in the literature, doing an environmental scan, and trying to find areas that tend to be higher utilization, so these are more commonly performed procedures, tests ordered, and then we go through a process of actually developing a formal measure and we explore in that process national claims data and go so far as to define a range of better practices. And this will become clearer in the next slide, but we're fairly generous recognizing some of the limitations of claims data and defining who's in and who's out from an exclusion standpoint, where the attribution falls, so who is the person that would be called out in this regard or attributed to that measure. And then we give most uh, clinicians, physicians, the benefit of the doubt in many cases, but define a range of better practice. We finally uh, interrogate the measure, uh, build it, spread it out in a pilot fashion, and then solicit feedback. So where it has gone live, we get feedback from boots on the ground clinicians to say, did you think about this, or what about this, or was it intending to measure this? And then we will iterate that whole process, and then ultimately uh, lead to an approval of that measure. I will also say that once a measure is approved, as we continue to spread it, there will be further iteration as there's a larger number of stakeholders that are exposed to the measure overall. We then, in the process, led by our physician champions, will do a measure review and essentially assess engagement, but we're heavily involved, and I have been, in trying to also share the rollout of these measures as well, because I often believe a clinician-to-clinician -clinician discussion helps to set the stage for why we're doing this in a non-punitive way and what we're intending to achieve by rolling this out overall. To bring a little bit of life to that in this next slide, it highlights an example of a uh, way in which we share data. And this example measure is with stress testing that happens to be done using nuclear imaging. Some of you may know that stress testing is very frequently done throughout the United States. And there are different types of stress tests that can be performed. Uh, there are usual so-called treadmill stress tests where you're asked to get on a treadmill and exercise, you're hooked up to an ECG or an EKG, and the EKG or ECG allows us to assess a higher or lower likelihood that they may have blockages of the arteries of the heart accounting for their symptoms. We do have the advantage of adding imaging to a regular treadmill stress test which affords, uh, in some cases, slightly higher sensitivity and specificity, but with it comes a dramatic increase in cost, and in the case of nuclear imaging, exposure to not insignificant amounts of radiation. And so there have been national standards that have been set up, appropriate use criteria within the cardiovascular community that have helped to define populations in whom nuclear stress testing is warranted, those individuals that may have an uninterpretable electrocardiogram, they can't exercise, but the vast majority of individuals don't fit in that category, and a regular treadmill stress test may be sufficient to establish the diagnosis in that regard.
So in this case, you can see that this is an example <clears throat> excuse me, of a distribution of different providers out there. You can see that each bar graph represents uh, the rates at which on the x-axis um, nuclear stress testing or percentages of their stress test where nuclear imaging is included is quite high. To the far right, 60%, 70%, 80% of the time of their stress tests are done with nuclear imaging. Those to the left side on the x-axis represent a nuclear stress testing being a smaller percentage of overall stress testing. And then the y-axis is the percent of physicians in each respective category. And we try and identify a national mean. I'll show you this in the next slide. But also in green, what we're defining as a range of better practice, where we believe better practice is being performed overall. If I show you in this next slide, this is a little bit of a deeper dive. But essentially, it's not just good enough to be able to measure this. But I think just as important is how you effectively share data back with clinicians, with physicians, so they understand this is being done in a non-punitive way, but it also gives them a perspective of where they sit relative to their peers and nationwide. So this is that same concept, but now instead of there being a nationwide swath, in this case, you can see that each bar graph, each bar in the bar graph represents a unique individual. And in this case, this individual in question, with some of their data shown on the right-hand slide, is illustrated in red. There is a vertical line in the middle that represents the national mean, so you have a distribution based on claims data of where you sit compared to nationwide. You have a dashed bar, uh, excuse me, line that's just to the right of that that represents the peer group mean. So if you're dealing with a practice of 35 cardiologists, what is the average performance for this measure for our group, the larger group, where does that sit relative to the mean? And then where do I sit within our group alone? And do I sit on the uh, left or right side of what we would consider both the mean, the peer group? And where do I sit relative to that green shade, shaded area, which represents the range of better practice overall? And so this is meant to allow people on a measure-by-measure -measure basis to understand the target rate, that range of better practice, where they sit where their peers sit around them. Each gray bar represents another colleague of theirs in the practice, and it allows them to have a full perspective of that whole concept of, I don't know what my partner's doing literally in the office next door or down the hall overall. So hopefully these types of reports have given you some insight into visibility into clinical decisions that in and of themselves, just being transparent about sharing data can drive many of the changes that Marty shared earlier uh, that people just blithely may be unaware of because they don't have access to the data. So with that, I'm going to turn things back to Lucy, and I know we're going to have ample opportunity for questions that will follow a little later. Thanks, Ty. So that was, um, that's one of the examples of a measure in our cardiology library. Um, what we've done with Ty and the rest of the Physician Advisory Council and Marty is build out these appropriate use measures um, in high spend, high waste specialties. So we've focused primarily on cardiology and orthopedics over the past year, um, but we are continuing to develop in new areas like oncology, GI, OBGYN. Um, and when we talk to you know, the leaders of ACOs, of clinically integrated networks, of health systems, um, and at payers, they say, well, the measures are great. They're so valuable. They're clinically grounded. It changes the conversations that we typically have with our physicians when we use data and analytics like this. But it's hard sometimes to know what to do when our physicians are getting, you know, their results on 10, you know, 20 measures. Um, how do they know holistically how well they're doing compared to their peers? And so what we've been doing um, in building on top of the appropriate use measures is actually rolling that up here into an appropriateness practice score per physician. So we are, you know, kind of considering, considering a, a GPA for a physician based on the types of services and procedures and patients they see based on their appropriateness performance on those individual measures, we're weighting that by volume, by cost, to create a, an aggregate appropriate practice score per physician. 
And what, what that's allowing um, payers and providers to do is power a range of different network management or physician management decisions, um, whether that's you know, taking the top performers and figuring out how to steer patients to the more appropriately practicing specialists through things like physician referral tools, patient navigation tools, transparency tools, or maybe even benefit or network design levers. Um, or another you know, big use of this is kind of hot spotting for the outliers within a network that you know, really need to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with the leadership to understand what it is they're doing that's um, kind of leading their holistic performance to be so far outside the range um, of what their peers, of how their peers are practicing. Um, another major use case, um, which you know, Marty has been demonstrating through the, the Mo surgery example is just providing these reports to physicians to nudge them toward um, improved practice patterns, kind of taking, uh, you know, using their, their intrinsic motivation to perform well and to deliver high quality care to their patients, um, showing them how they're practicing so that they can improve based on information alone. Um, and then fourth, I think in, we're kind of in the early stages early stages of exploring how we would integrate appropriateness into things like specialist reimbursement programs or value-based reimbursement programs. Um, the idea here really is to say, okay, since appropriateness has been the missing piece in how we evaluate physician performance, how can we bring it into all the ways we evaluate physician performance today so that we no longer have that blind spot? Um, and today we're working with um, two you know, major customer segments. Um, they're the ACOs or the you know, clinically integrated networks where they're trying to prepare for value or perhaps they're already taking some risk or some downside risk on their patient population. And their goal is really to um, use Practicing Wisely as a way to provide visibility to their physicians, um, to their specialists in particular about their own practice patterns. Um, and to, to you know, motivate them to improve. And then on the other side, we're working with payers um, through our network improvement solution to also help them identify you know, how physicians are practicing relative to each other and relative to benchmarks. Um, and we can also help them assess how much savings opportunity there is in improving the network's performance um, on you know, each individual measure, each individual specialty or subspecialty, and how much of that savings you can capture through Im improvement versus potentially creating a high performing network or a narrow network. All right. So um, I think at this point, it would be great to talk a little bit about how the experience has been with one of our um, customers to date, so Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Um, Michael, we've been, we've been piloting Practicing Wisely with you in Tennessee over the last six months or so. Um, let's, let's dive into that uh, and let's talk about how the pilot has been going and what kind of impact you've observed. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Lucy, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, being with us today to talk through this. We have been working here at Blue Cross um, of Tennessee with Practicing Wisely for several months um, and have launched a pilot, and I will walk you through really sort of a, a process uh, overview of, of the pilot at a high level. Um, I think it's been interesting as a health plan um, to hear about the, uh, the idea of appropriateness. I think there's um, a lot of widespread support for that as a topic that we should be focusing on. Uh, what has been especially interesting is when that has been brought by a health plan to a physician group, um, how, that, how that discussion has played out. So we'll talk about that um, some, some here in, in a minute. Um, but but uh, the, I think a key to our uh, approach has been uh, engagement. Uh, and so when we first uh, started talking about doing this pilot, we identified a few groups that we thought uh, were um, uh, in, a, in a place as a group to, to be willing to have this conversation um, and to be willing to, um, to be open-minded about, about, um, about their performance um, as well as their willingness to be open-minded about the idea of being brought to them by a health plan. Uh, and so we did seek out um, some initial groups. And if you look at the chart on this slide, uh, 
it you know moves from left to right, and you'll see that there are different roles that the, the three groups here, practicing wisely, Blue Cross, and the physicians themselves played. You know, but initially, practicing wisely helped us look at opportunities uh, around some some measures. We focused on cardiology, chose that uh, here in Tennessee, and really did uh, what I called an opportunity analysis, where we looked at it and said, is there an opportunity to move the needle here with this with this group within this specialty? Um, and then, when, then once we realized that there were some opportunities, we took the next step, which was to go engage those practices, met with their clinical leadership, and just pitch the idea, really. Um, and the the response there was was frankly it was mixed. In some cases, it was um, it was met with um, I'd say open arms, um, and in other cases, uh, uh, there were some folded arms, um, which I think were both fair pieces of feedback and, and certainly what we expected. Um, and I think a lot of that gets to something that was discussed earlier around um, you know lots of different ways physicians are being measured um, and evaluated and against what benchmarks. Um, and I think what has been refreshing about the conversation we've had when we started talking with these, the physician practice leadership is, um, is the need for um, a, a universally accepted, um, clinically uh, validated, clinically based yardstick to say this is a reasonable way for us to measure, expect, uh, to measure appropriateness uh, and sort of manage, ex manage the expectations around that conversation. So. I think the, a lot of the process that Ty just walked us through were really, really helpful in engaging the physician leadership at these practices to even be willing to entertain the conversation around a pilot. Um, so that was great. They then helped us identify physician champions, and you've heard that phrase referenced before. I think it's a perfect phrase, um, you know, recognizing that, um, you know, if I were to show up as a health plan guy and try and talk to a bunch of cardiologists about this, probably wouldn't be welcomed the same way a member of their own practice who's a practicing cardiologist um, who has uh, earned a level of respect within the practice. Uh, they're, just, they're just met two very different ways. And so identifying those physician champions um, and, and bringing them up to speed on the, the data and the, the science behind this approach has been really, really helpful. We'll talk a little bit about some of the responses from them shortly, but uh, universally the physician champions, um, you know, are ones who are early adopters and bought into it. And just as a footnote, the physician champions are not all um, people who perform great across every measure. Uh, and so that was not a criteria um, for the physician champions. In fact, you know, what we found is most of them had uh, sort of mixed performance against uh, different measures. So then we, we, um, we then turned that over to the, to the uh, physician champions to go back to their, to go back to their groups and, uh, and talk about this concept in a little more detail. Um, and then um, we will equip them, we do equip them with, uh, with the reports. Uh, and then uh, we work with them to understand those reports, sort of do some mock conversations to be prepared to answer some typical questions they might get back. And then the physicians, the physician champions take those reports and they meet one-on-one -on -one with different members of the group and go through those, uh, go through those individual uh, reports and help understand what they mean and importantly, what they don't mean. Um, and, uh, and then over the course of time, we monitor feedback, have regular touch points um, with those uh, physician champions just to monitor how those conversations are going. Um, we are just, we're probably to that point right now in our pilot. Uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to is um, hearing how the feedback changes over the course of the pilot. You know, we've heard some initial um, uh, first reports, and I think for the most part they're positive, but I'm curious how those conversations evolve and become more deeper um, over the course of the pilot as they get past where the initial report about how they're doing and then see how that's trending or tracking over time. I think it'll lead to some really interesting, really interesting discussions. Uh, and then we'll go back through and we will rerun the data and share reports um, to track how that, um, how those individual positions have, um, ha how their uh, practice patterns have changed over time. Uh, and, and then we'll sort of do it over again, the whole cycle over again. Um, and then we'll, you know, look down the road, new measures, new specialties, that type of thing. Um, we're at a place at Blue Cross where, um, you know, we're very interested in seeing uh, 
how this plays out in Tennessee. I think the the um, Mohs surgery example that Marty mentioned uh, was really, really encouraging. Um, and I think one of the things that is really fascinating about this approach is um, that you present data to physicians. And uh, um, my belief is, based on what we've seen so far, is that the reports themselves uh, trigger behavior change. Um, and it does not necessarily require uh, a carrot or a stick from the health plan. And certainly that uh, was indicated in what we saw from, from the Mohs surgery example. Um, and so, uh, so these reports are really, really powerful. I, I say the reports are the intervention, um, and they start some great conversations. What you see here is um, sort of the way, uh, just a glance what it looks like with the groups that we're piloting with. You can see, you know, we're looking at it from a Blue Cross of Tennessee network mean as well as a national mean. Um, that's a helpful perspective for us. Um, but uh, I think one of the key things here is it provides um, a relative comparison against peers. Um, and the, one, of the, one of the biggest things that I believe about this that we've heard and what we've heard from physicians is that relativity um, is a new view. It's a lens they've not been able to, um, to look through before to see how they're doing compared to uh, their peer down the hall, much less across the, the, the state or across the nation. And so just a really, really valuable data set uh, to give a new look for clinicians and, and um, can't understate how, how much that has been uh, a benefit of, of us rolling out these reports as we've, as we've shared them with some of the docs. And this is before they've even seen their performance. Um, just uh, hearing the concept and understanding um, the approach, uh, I think the early validation is that, that, that this is a, a way to be evaluated, a way to be looked at um, that allows them to see how they're doing compared to their peers and do something about it, um, which, has been, which has been great and really, really valuable. Um, just a little bit more about the, um, the, 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 the process. Um, education and um, uh, spending a lot of time understanding the measures has been a really critical part of this. Um, and with a lot of help from the Practicing Wisely team and, and Ty and Marty, um, we've, we've, we've had a, a lot of success in this area. It's not a surprise to anyone that when a health plan shows up with a report to a physician, that's not always met with, with open arms. Um, but I think being able to have the conversations um, at a pretty deep level around measure development, uh, clinical appropriateness, how do these measure up with my, uh, with the national guidelines I'm supposed to follow within my specialty practice. Those have been really, really, um, really, really helpful conversations in getting buy-in to the concept. Um, it's not always been positive. There have been some negative pieces of it. Um, but, you know, overall, I'd give it a, a, a positive grade. When we introduced um, the pilot to the practices initially, um, really positive response there. I think that was mainly born out of the fact that they viewed this as data they didn't have access to today. One of the groups had spent a couple of years trying to develop ways to analyze um, their cardiology practices uh, and had not yet really come up with a, a good yardstick for them to do their own measurement, but they told us that of all the things they've been looking at, they, didn't, they hadn't even begun to consider how they might be able to um, to, to get the same type of relative comparison that, that the practicing wisely approach brings. So that was universally, uh, universally welcomed. Um, when we started introducing it to the, to the larger groups, we did hit some, um, uh, some pushback initially, which, you know, again, we expected. I think it was, um, uh, it was yet another new set of measures. Um, and, you know, there were some who said if you, if you um, expect me to believe this is anything other than a cost-cutting measure, uh, I don't believe a word you have to say. Um, and that there were, there were some who sort of, I would say, um, acquiesced almost like they knew this day was coming, uh, that they would have to have this conversation, right? So, um, and, and so, uh, again, I'd say that was to be expected. And our response in those situations was, look, let's run this pilot. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's have these conversations. And at the end of it, you know, we'll identify areas where uh, we need to make some considerations that maybe we're not thinking about today. And in return, uh, you know, the group will have had a series of individual and group conversations around this. And, you know, that in and of itself is worth the time and energy to, to pursue. And so we're able to get past that step. 
um, and led us to where we are today, where we're sharing uh, the measures and the results uh, with the physician champions. Um, and as part of that, it's been fascinating. Uh, when we met with the physician champions, um, the initial feedback um, uh, just sort of proved to me that this concept uh, has the ability to move the needle. Uh, you know, we heard things like um, yeah, when we when we when we shared those physician champions, when we shared their own reports with them, they were immediately introspective and looking at it and saying, "Wow, um, I thought I was pretty conservative in this area, but apparently I'm not as much as I thought." Um, uh, and, and so, within 30 seconds of receiving the report, there was this uh, this conversation happening with with that physician, uh, you know, with himself, uh, based on the report he had just seen, um, and then as he takes those reports out to meet with other members of the of the group, they will have similar conversations. He will also then be able to, to say, like I mentioned before, I, I didn't do a great job on this measure either. Here's something I'm thinking about. What are you thinking about? Those one-on-one -on -one conversations, I think, get to be really, really meaningful and really, really powerful. Everyone is sort of uh, a little bit vulnerable here, um, which I think, um, which I think I've, I've been really, really pleased with. Uh, with the willingness to consider um, uh, what the what the reports are telling those individual physicians, especially when it's from the physician champions, um, and, and then some of the conversations as we've shared the performance with the with the broader practice, it's been interesting. Um, there was a great discussion had around, um, you know, if we end up at the same place from an outcome standpoint, what does it really matter? That's sort of oversimplification of the feedback, but that was the that was the the, the point being made, and you know, within the group, they had a they had a discussion around that. Um, and what I loved was a report that was brought, you know, through Practicing Wisely and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee to a group led to that type of conversation, um, and allowed them to have that conversation, um, you know, based on what they are doing within their own four walls. Uh, this the the fact that that conversation happened, I think, is a wonderful is a wonderful outcome. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, we're distributing reports and, and starting to get some of that um, feedback back from the physician champions as they, um, as they have those conversations. Um, and interestingly, one of the themes that's come up consistently is around transparency. You know, we initially approached this assuming that all of the reports needed to be individualized and blinded and, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I'd say more often times than not, we've been told, uh, either no, 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 we share all that openly in our practice today, or we don't yet do that, but we really want to, and this may be a good way for us to, to break the seal on that. So this conversation around transparency and being willing to be open enough with each other within a group, um, I think leads to really, again, really valuable discussions around um, appropriateness and how do, how do the individual physicians view that and, and what triggers does that cause in their own mind, but also at a group level, um, what, what kind of conversations does that spur along? So really encouraged by, um, by what we've seen uh, as we've rolled out um, these reports and the, and the methodology to the, to, the, to the physician community that's participating in our pilot. Um, and this last slide just gives some really great quotes these are actual quotes from actual cardiologists um, that, that, have, that have seen this. Um, and again, I think when you look at um, things like this top quote, you know, you had both ends of the spectrum. Um, you know, th this decision was made 0% of the time by some of our physicians and 100% of the time by the others. Uh, you know, you see there's a wake-up call. That's, the fact that that's happening is probably not surprising given how much variability we know exists in healthcare. Um, but the fact that we can now bring that to the forefront, make it visible, and show it to a, a group, um, I think it's a really powerful, really, really powerful, powerful tool. Um, we, we, uh, we did hear one group um, say that they basically knew that there was a member of their group um, who was an outlier, but they didn't have any data to prove it. Um, and so that just tells me, you know, there is the desire to to want to practice better. There's the desire to help physicians who aren't practicing um, uh, probably uh, the most appropriate way to help them get better, um, but, but they lack the tools to do that. Um, and I think this identifies that this is a tool that we're able to bring to them to help, to help have some of those conversations internally. Um, and then um, the, last, the last, my takeaway from this last quote is 
and I think it's a, a great uh, point for me to end my part on is, you know, what I have heard um, that's been most encouraging through the conversations with each of these groups around our pilot is that uh, the, every physician and I think each one of the groups genuinely want to improve. You know, even the doc that, that, that just viewed this as a pure cost-cutting measure um, is it, it's someone who wants to do better. And um, I, think, I think this type of evaluation on appropriateness with the clinical um, thoroughness that's gone into these measures really does um, give the physicians that we've interacted with here in Tennessee the, uh, a, a new tool um, to, to do better, uh, which, is, which is ultimately what I think is motivating them in the first place. And so it's nice to see that, that we can meet that motivation with a really helpful tool that's actionable for them. Um, and that's probably one of my biggest positive takeaways from our experience thus far in the pilot. Ty and Marty, you all have been a part of those conversations with each one of these groups as well, and you may have some other observations. I'd love it if you all could take a minute and share some of your thoughts on what you've seen as we've had these conversations. Thank you, Michael. I'll take a quick um, stab at answering that. I, I would say that variation in the practice of medicine is important. It's how we physicians tailor treatments to individual patients' goals, needs, and unique comorbidities and circumstances. So we want to embrace variation. And I think part of the alienation that uh, a lot of clinicians have had about measurement has come around the sort of lack of respect for the importance of tailoring care uh, to individual patients. And I think the approach of practice pattern measures has essentially said, as you alluded to, Michael, that variation is important, but within certain boundaries. And we are gonna let you, the experts, who are busy practicing and seeing all the different forms of variation in care, tell us what the reasonable boundaries of variation are. So I think one reason that this has resonated so well with so many clinicians is that it does embrace variation. Instead of physicians being under, under a microscope where they're being hammered for deviating from a pathway on an individual patient's care, instead it basically embraces that patients are different, doctors have specialty case mix, um, focus areas, and variation is good, but within boundaries, and those boundaries are part of this program, and they define those boundaries. And the other observation I would say I've noticed is that doct we doctors are data-driven from day one of school. And I think, you know, in medical school, we're basically taught to almost, you know, play whack-a-mole with non-data-driven evidence or non-data-driven information. So for example, somebody might come along and say, um, have you heard of this you know, dietary change affecting health or treating a certain condition? And our classic Western medicine response has been, well, there's no data to support it. And we've sort of confused that with uh, a lack of data means that it's not true, when in fact, the lack of data simply means it's unknown, whether or not it's true. We're so data-driven that when a metric comes to us that is crude, like, say, raw mortality or overall utilization of, say, x-rays, um, it can alienate the physicians. But when the metrics are smart, for example, what proportion of your knee arthroscopies are the median meniscectomy only procedure relative to ACL, PCL repair procedures? Expert knee surgeons say it should be greater than 50% of your procedures are the repairs and not the meniscectomy only. Those that are doing 90, 100% of high volume knee arthroscopy as the meniscectomy only is outside the boundaries of reasonable variation. That's a smart metric, and I think that creates the healthy discussions among the clinicians that you've alluded and cited, Michael. So thank you. And Michael, this is Ty. I'll, I'll say briefly, I, I agree with everything that Marty has shared already. You know, sometimes these are really difficult conversations, and it helps to have a change agent. This is, this is really fundamentally, in fact, everything we do in healthcare now that we're trying to evolve from because we're very inertia-driven. We've done things this way for 5, 10, 30 years. 
is about how do you change practice patterns where it's appropriate to do so. And again, I think there is a level of variation in practice that is justified, appropriate, and actually allows us to learn from one another in that regard. Um, I, I love the so I, I would say a couple of things. Number one is your ability to find those individuals that may be early, mid, or late career. It, it varies practice to practice of people who have the ear of their practice that can help to uh, direct in a productive way the discussion is of infinite help. Number two, this is a bi-directional conversation. I never enter into these conversations saying, saying, here's what you need to do, and we know better than you about what the measure should be and what the range of better practice should be. But you recognize that there are geographic variations. There may be selection biases based uh, that are appropriate based on who certain clinicians see in their practice that may justify and explain that variability overall. I, I will, I guess, add one other thing is to say sometimes in an attempt to implement a measure, questions come back, and it, you know, we've had some measures where they're saying so do you want me to stent more people? And I, it, it's funny, and we can laugh at it, but it, it, you know, people often see when a measure is placed in front of them some action they want taken, and sometimes the actions that some people come back with are certainly not the ones you want them to do, and so it invites a lot more conversation. And I think people being willing to come to the table is by far and away the most important uh, issue and um, entertaining the conversation. Very quickly, you realize, Michael, just as you shared, is many of the clinicians didn't have this data to get back to M Marty's point, didn't have this data beforehand, and having the availability of the data to understand where they sit in the spectrum of their practice nationwide is very eye-opening overall. So, um, you know, there are, there are times that this cannot go as well, but I would say in most cases, coming in under non-punitive terms with a change agent in their practice that's well-respected and understanding that this is a ongoing conversation uh, that isn't unidirectional are some real important keys. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, well said. And I, I think the one thing that I wanted to add when I thought about, you know, the way that physicians have been reacting in these conversations is it just it changes the basis of the conversation so much from what I've seen with, you know, between payers and providers. It's not about unit cost. Definitely. It's, not a, it's not even about cost. We don't even talk about cost when we talk about these practice patterns. Yeah, it's a totally different and totally refreshing conversation. I agree. And I think that's part of what makes it so unusual, uh, maybe a little bit un uncomfortable at first, is because it's not the typical conversation. I think once they get into it, I think they become really engaged because it is a very different conversation and a very different, um, a different view from the health plan side of that practice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's led to conversations where, you know, even though you'll be at the table, Michael, representing the payer, you know, the physicians will be talking to each other in front of us and saying, wow, I, you know, I'll admit it, I'm already thinking about that nuclear imaging, you know, how I can do the nuclear imaging, even though, um, even if I am doing something else like a treadmill stress test, I, I hate doing treadmills. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you don't hear that kind of a conversation between a payer and provider very often where, you know, they can talk about how they practice and, and agree on mm -hmm. what the, you know, what the, the right things are to consider. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it, cause it speaks to their desire to do the best they can do, yeah. right? So this creates an opportunity. They're going to engage on that. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think we wanted to, we wanted to move to the Q and A, you know, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, let's see, Catherine, should we, should I flip it over to you to guide us through the Q&A? Sure. Yes. Thank you. We have a great audience today from policy, business, and government. So, uh, continue to submit your questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, uh, first, uh, sort of a, a comment and then a question for Michael. First, um, uh, kudos for adopting physician design measures as part of your quality management process. And then a question, is there a different response from physicians who are already involved in value-based reimbursement programs versus those that are still primary engaged in traditional fee-for-service? Yeah, it's a great question, and we have not rolled this out. We've, we've rolled this out primarily with groups that are heavily still into the fee-for-service uh, arrangements. Um, and that was, um, quite honestly, that was uh, was a fairly intentional decision. 
uh, right? Because that, that motivation to change is not necessarily built in. Um, uh, it, so it really does play to the, I don't say the purity of the approach, but it does, if you take away that incentive uh, and you test it with a group that doesn't have that incentive built in, if you do see movement, it validates that um, when presented with information around how they practice relative to their peers, physicians will change their behavior. Um, so they're doing that without that financial incentive built in. And so um, that, that's part of why we chose that framework uh, or that environment to, to, to do this pilot. Uh, obviously, you can believe that if there is, a, if there is a, another incentive on top of that, financial or otherwise, you, you would expect to see this data help move them in an even more positive direction. Um, but so we were, I think we were really looking at testing the principle or, or the idea, the hypothesis behind the approach here. Um, I think you would see the benefits of that being even greater if you did roll that out into a, uh, an ACO, which were risk-based environment, but we did not do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Ty. When providing the personalized reports, how do you deal with the physician that says his or her numbers are higher because their patients are more complicated? Yeah, it's a, that's a phenomenal question, and this is the response that we've gotten historically in the quality arena is, um, the reason I have these rates of events or complications is because I take care of sicker patients. I, I will say in the quality arena, we have the ability to do some risk adjustment methodology in some circumstances, but very often we don't. Um, I think the reality is, A, we have provide in terms of the, the range of better practice a relatively wide swath knowing that there are a limitation of claims-based data. And then we want practice is to contextualize this. So in general, um, you know, the, the funny thing is, is, and, uh, is that, you know, you'll have conversations in a group and one physician will say, well, I take care of the sickest patients. And the one next to them will say, well, actually, I take care of sicker patients. And they'll go around and they'll all realize that they're probably taking care of largely the same types of patients more often than not. So I would say we don't have a direct way of addressing it right now. We try very clearly to exclude or to introduce exclusion criteria where it can confound interpretation of the results. Um, we want them these to be more generalizable, meaningful results. But at the end of the day, I personally am okay that if they find that there's an outlier in their practice, but there's a selection bias because of the patients that they see or all of the patients that have had a kidney transplant, you know, go to this provider, that may define a different population than the practice sees as a whole, and for that matter, is seen nationwide. So I think you'll see movement as a practice overall, given the wide variability that's often observed. But it, again, may be appropriate that there are individuals who are quote-unquote outliers for more appropriate reasons. Great. Thank you. Uh, question for Marty, are inappropriate treatment rates any different uh, in other countries, those with the National Health Service, or in integrated systems like Kaiser? That's a great question. I, I don't know if those studies have been done. I, um, you would certainly um, believe that the incentives are aligned differently in a globally capitated model. When I've spent time at um, the globally capitated primary care models, including those that assume downstream risk like ChenMed, but also Iora, Oak Street, some of these other globally capitated primary care models, they're spending a lot of time with patients. And they want to make sure that if they're on a medication, there's a very good reason for it and that the patient's actually compliant. So you do see how the change of alignment and of incentives in certain uh, systems uh, are changing the practice of medicine, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if the utilization rates are lower outside of the traditional fee-for-service treadmill. Great. Thank you. A uh, question for Michael. How were the physician champions enrolled, and what was the arrangement with them for the, the time that they invested in it? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, um, it, and it's actually really interesting. Um, so the the um, the practice leadership helped us identify the physician champions, and we did talk with them quite a bit around uh, the type of uh, the type of physician we thought would be ideally suited. I, you know, uh, for example, that they are have the respect of their peers, um, uh, and also that they have you know the time available. 
Um, and there was a, a good part of our um, conversation was around um, expectations. And so we actually went through a process that the Practicing Wisely team led us through where we identified roles and responsibilities for Practicing Wisely, roles and responsibilities for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, and then what we're asking of those physician champions. And so uh, I think for the most part, gave them a really good idea of what they were being asked to do. Um, and it was purely an ask. Uh, and all of them have willingly agreed to do it, uh, just as part of the um, as part of their uh, commitment to to uh, testing this thing out. And so uh, we did not make any other arrangements other than that. Um, we'll probably send them a nice fruit basket at the end to thank them for their time. But that's really the only consideration that we're that we're giving to those physician champions. Great, thank you. A question for Lucy. Uh, you mentioned the Walmart data, which a lot of people were interested in, and they were curious um, how they found that. Was it through case reviews, use of a particular tool uh, to find the variations in care? Um, well, we could, so in, you know, some of the data has to do with the fact that after they rolled out the Centers of Excellence, which I think started several years ago um, in a more opt-in format, I think now it's actually mandatory for some procedures. Um, so just tracking what percent of patients, you know, after their local physicians recommended a certain treatment for them, when they paid for that, that patient and their family to go to one of their centers of excellence, what the outcome was after they saw the physicians at, you know, Mayo or Cleveland Clinic or one of their, their other centers of excellence. Great. Thank you. Um, a question for Ty, what has, what's really the relationship between inappropriate care and patient-centered care, and are those concepts in conflict, and how do we spur the system toward more patient-centeredness without, without also spurring more inappropriate care? Yeah, so I think it's a phenomenal question, and I can give the perspective in the cardiology community. I think that they're really tightly aligned. In, in most circumstances, when we've arrived at consensus across a professional society or multiple professional societies as less appropriate care, it's because there's an evidence base supporting that, either because it provides no incremental value and therefore is a waste, or it incurs harm, or both. And so I would say, in both respects, being a good steward of patient healthcare dollars and resources and trying to limit harm, it's rather patient-centered. I, I will tell you that as a practicing clinician, the challenge that we have is some, not surprisingly to all of you on the phone, some patients uh, either relocate and therefore establish with a new care provider or split their time between different cities and have two cardiologists. And a lot of my time sometimes is spent uh, discussing with a patient, and I hope a very patient-centered way, why the practice patterns that may have been adopted in the past may not actually be what's in their best interest going forward. So it often takes time. You know, I'll give you an example. It's an anecdote, but I think it's not an unreasonable one of, you know, I'd have seen a patient who had a coronary stent who, uh, in the setting of a heart attack, who ended up getting, while they were asymptomatic, a nuclear stress test every single year. And the patient came to me, and the first thing they asked is, when can I schedule my nuclear stress test? They had relocated, and I said, I want to make sure you're asymptomatic, and they said they were. And I said, there's really no value to this, and all it's doing is incurring increased radiation and cost. And they were very much of the belief that they were alive today because of that test. And in fact, it required a very detailed conversation over multiple encounters to try and make them understand that it, the data supported or did not support that practice pattern. And so I, I, I just want to call out the fact that I think patient-centeredness is implied often by a lot of these measures, and I think it goes hand in hand. But it doesn't mean automatically that it will be received immediately by a patient in the same way that a parent may be wanting an antibiotic for a child in whom it may not be appropriate overall as well. Sure. Um, Michael, do you want to comment on that? I know Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee is very kind of focused on patient-centeredness and your patient-centered medical home initiatives and focused on, you know, quality care for your members. Yeah, I, I, I would just I would just offer this. I think um, when we looked at uh, when we looked at this approach, I think we identified a um, we are not focusing a whole lot on appropriate. We don't have a lot of um, tools or measurements in place to focus on appropriateness, um, and so that made sense 
uh, from that standpoint. But also, I think when you know we've talked about the impacts of uh, moving the needle around appropriateness of care, there's clearly a benefit to to the uh, to our member. Um, but there's also a benefit to the practice, um, and and that all those things also work to the benefit of, of Blue Cross Blue Shield from the standpoint of I think this is a way to help us have uh, a higher performing network within our existing network of contracted providers. And so, you know, there's all the conversations around high value networks, high performing networks, and that sort of thing. From our standpoint, to the extent that you can help a practice move to uh, move more of their providers within those guardrails of appropriateness, that helps our overall existing network performance uh, as well. So there's a lot of reasons why I think this plays into what we're, what we're doing here. Um, and I think, you know, whether it's patient-centered medical home program or any of the other ways we evaluate our network, I think that there are, you know, the uh, benefits that apply here in lots of different places, and that's really a uh, big part of what attracts our interest in doing this. Sure. Um, Another question for Michael, um, was the practice participation in your model voluntary or did you send reports regardless of interest and are there any differences in results so far for voluntary yes, versus um, non-voluntary? Yeah, it was all voluntary. So we met with, uh, with the leadership of the three different um, groups and pitched the idea uh, and that was universally uh, re well received. Um, and once the leadership was interested in, and uh, agreed to it, you know, not surprisingly, um, you know, identifying other physicians to, to come along with us was, was not too difficult of a, of a climb, but it was all voluntary, um, and we did just do it with these three groups, and so, um, uh, so there was no, uh, uh, there, are, there are no strings attached, there were no threats associated with it. It was uh, purely an invitation to participate and try this and look and see. I think what was interesting too is, you know, once we uh, were able to start to share some initial data with them, uh, they realized that, you know, there were some opportunities here, you know, and in, and in some ways I think it was viewed as free data uh, and free data that they don't have access to today. Uh, and so, you know, they came into it voluntarily. I think as they've learned more, I think they've been even more willing to voluntarily continue to participate in it. Great, thank you. Um, for our last few minutes, I just wanted to um, allow our speakers kind of one final chance just to weigh in on this this issue. And you know, unnecessary care is really an ecosystem problem. And from your perspectives, what do you think we can tackle it going forward? I'll start with Lucy. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, and I think when we look at the big picture, our healthcare system is not really designed to optimize for appropriate care, right? Most of our physicians are getting paid to not have those conversations that Ty is having with his patient. You know, they're getting paid more to spend less time with patients. They're getting pressured to decrease the amount of time per patient and increase the number of visits um, per day and to deliver more services instead of less. So it's almost a miracle, I think, that physicians are still doing the right thing most of the time. Um, and I think in, you know, what the, of the people represented here today, you know, there are payers, providers, there are third-party uh, vendors, analytics companies, tech companies, um, like Practicing Wisely. Um, and I think there is a role for all of these players, as well as policy, which we haven't yet really touched on during this webinar, um, to create more pressure from all of the different roles within the healthcare system to move toward more appropriate medicine, to change the culture um, that more care might be better, that some people might feel that, that that's the right thing to do. Um, so I think there is a role for, for all of these players, um, and it always you know, I always think back to how, you know, the physicians, I know people who've gone into medicine, they went in because they wanted to do the right thing for patients. They wanted to positively impact patients, and they, were, they loved the science of medicine. Um, they didn't necessarily go in to, to deal with physician behavior change on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so to some extent, I think there is a necessity um, to uh, apply this kind of pressure to create behavior change and culture change, not just from the inside, but also from the outside through analytics, through technology, through um, payers and, and policy. 
Marty, do Marty, you want to go next? Sure. I think that there are two problems in the appropriateness issue in medicine, over-treatment and under-treatment and issues of access. But if we look collectively at the entire system and the massive growth of the healthcare spend over recent years, it's clear that overtreatment is by far the rampant problem in the appropriateness issue. And although the appropriateness measures and practice pattern measures measure both oftentimes, the research certainly supports that the overtreatment is the low hanging fruit. The Lou study cited that 21% of all medical care was unnecessary, but if you break it down, it was 22% of all medications and 25% of all tests and 11% of all surgical procedures. Um, the last um, slide, which I'm not sure if it will come up or not, but this research, for those interested in the topic of value and healthcare costs, my team and I have put together uh, the research on practice pattern measures, uh, there it's coming up, um, and the stories of the most disruptive and futuristic innovators that we could find in the country around these issues in the new book, The Price We Pay, which is now available. And really, these practice pattern measures are trying to capture appropriateness, recognize that we don't only need evidence-based medicine, we need wisdom-based medicine. And there are some things you can't, just can't do a randomized control trial for, but we can learn a lot from the wisdom of doctors. And that this is really to help improve. There's a huge re, uh, uh, return on investment, and this can be a homegrown uh, endeavor that really gets everybody on the same page, getting around some of the adversarial relationships that come out of the, you deviated from this pathway on this individual patient approach that to quality science that we've historically had. So with that, I'll just say thank you. Thanks, Marty. Ty? Yeah, I'll make this brief. Um, and I, I would just say, uh, in fault to what Marty had said, I, I, I think that there is, there, let me be clear, there are a lot of challenges in implementation, in acceptance of this. Almost all clinicians want and physicians want to be able to do the right thing. And I think the ability to transparently and non-punitively share data with clinicians about their performance developed by physicians for physicians can go an awfully long way. And with that, I will say thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you. Michael, you got the last word. That's great. I never get the last word, so thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just say this. I think, uh, I think you know, uh, one of the big roles of the, of the payer here is, you know, we have the data, and I think when we can take the data uh, and run it up against um, clinically valid um, uh, guidelines that can produce uh, uh, reports uh, and information that's actionable, on the physician's part. I think that's an obligation we have and a role that, that you know, we're glad to play. Um, I think the best part about it, though, is it plays to the motivations that, that you know, that Ty just mentioned is, you know, they want, to do, they want to do better, they want to do the right thing, they want to do it as well as they can. And so to the extent that we can provide that information, you know, um, you know whether or not it, it is tied to a reimbursement change, whether or not their, their practice patterns over time you know, result in uh, a rate discussion or any of those types of things. You know, as I mentioned, um, uh, you know, what we've seen early on uh, through the, the MOSE example and, and, and some other conversations we've heard is, you know, these reports start a conversation to start to move the needle and start to talk about appropriateness. You know, that benefits members, it benefits the physician practice, and it benefits the, 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 the payer. So I think, you know, this kind of a, a new look uh, from this, from this new perspective uh, has the ability to sort of raise all boats across the ecosystem. And, and I'm glad that that conversation is happening, glad it's underway, and glad to have a chance to talk about that with you guys today. So thank you for the chance to be with you. Well, thank you all for this really interesting discussion and for being with us today. And for our audience, we hope you'll take a moment to share feedback from this event by completing a brief survey, which can be found on the bottom of your screen. We'll be posting a recording of the discussion if you'd like to share with any colleagues. Um, and you can also go to our, the webinar registration page to view other resources on the topics discussed today. So thank you all again for joining us today.